so hot. <sighs> Welcome back to our Hounds for Life podcast show. This is episode eight. And today I'm sitting here with our guest host, Caro. Hi, Maya. Hi, everybody. We have uh, exciting footage um, uh, taken for you guys and I'm really keen to show you this episode. It's all about artistic um, creative things mm -hmm. and Caro is the expert in this because she is an artist and an art teacher and she is taking us through, uh, which you will see later on, how to draw your greyhound and we also get to have a tour in her artistic studio, which mm. is actually really exciting <laughs> and you. inspiring. Thank you. Well, thank you for being on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Wonderful. Yeah. So, so first of all, I'd like to say um, how exciting it is, start of 2020. And the first thing is catching up with Maya about what is happening at Te Paranui since the last podcast. So over to you, Maya. What's been going on? Wow. So I haven't been uh, on the show for over a month now. And uh, it's summer. It's getting hot. And it was so much going on. Uh, at Paranui, mainly, we are very busy with our volunteers. Uh, mm. We have up to five uh, or even six volunteers. So we have full house. Uh, lots to do in the garden with the animals, with the animal sanctuary, and of course with Hounds for Life, with our dogs. And uh, we were haying. Uh, our manager Dan has even uh, tried his skills on the side mm -hmm. and was haying in the old fashioned way as well, which is really mm, exciting fantastic. to see that this actually worked. Um, yeah, and then Hounds for Life, there was lots going on. We had actually. Um, you had a record. Some kind of record was established and broken, I believe. I think so. I ha actually, I, th I really think that was a record um, in rehoming greyhounds. We have mm -hmm. rehomed uh, eight greyhounds in wow. the last two months, all on the top of the South Island. Wow, Practically that's amazing. Practically a dog a week or something. Yes. Yeah, I'm very excited about that. And thank you here, shout out to the great community for everybody of you who is uh, come and had a meet and greet and was interested in greyhounds and uh, uh, decided to adopt a greyhound and um, maybe we'll be in a future podcast. I hope so, that you all share your experience yeah. with your new companion and it was absolutely lovely to see this happy families mm. and the happy mm. dogs and I just love to see that. That's I'm very passionate mm. about That's what I love to see. To match so the right a, people at the right time. Hound for life, but it's a companion for life as well. It's isn't a companion it? for life, yeah. And often in families as well, with children and maybe even other dogs, other hounds as yeah, well. That's New true. addition. Yep, yep. We often have mm. uh, so families. Uh, most of most of our owners mm. are, are actually families mm. um, with kids um, and uh, also with other animals, um, mainly other dogs or cats, mm. or um, sometimes a bird or. Even oh, rabbits. Wow. Really? Even yeah. rabbits. Yeah. Whoosh. Yeah, that happened. That's a challenge, isn't, isn't it? it? <laughs> but it works. Yeah. Some dogs. Yeah, you just find the right dog. So do you yeah. find that um, now that you're established now with Hounds for Life podcast that um, people are really using your or looking at the footage and learning more about greyhounds before they decide to come and talk to you about Hounds that's a good question, Caro. I yeah. actually think that's the case. It's been really helpful. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I get comments right. that, yeah, yeah, people seeing podcast episodes and uh, asking uh, very educated questions, yeah. which is awesome. <laughs> because I, I live also at the top of the South Island and people are often quite a long distance from each other, yeah. sometimes in a rural situation. And so to meet other people with greyhounds is not so common. So to have a podcast like this where you can meet your greyhound family and feel that you're able to welcome one is really important isn't it thank you that's mm. a great feedback yeah mm. i think we are doing mm. quite a good job and we will certainly continue to do it and also we have overseas uh people who tune in as well i know that for sure because some of my friends in england have got greyhounds yay so that's really nice welcome <laughs> welcome to you guys from england to this podcast yes. and from all over the world yes we hope. greyhounds travel all over the world don't they yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Great. Um, the next thing, what happened as well? Oh, oh. what about uh, at Te Paranui? Who's looking after the dogs at the moment? We have a lovely volunteer. She's from Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, her name is Lou. Mm -hmm. And if she stays, she stays for She's quite a while. She's an international she is. greyhound. Looking Expert after now. person. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we might see her in the next episode. I hope she oh. stays on for longer. Great. And... Um, 
and uh, we had also homestays. Of course, it's summer holiday oh, season, yes, yes. and uh, lots of people want to go away. And we are offering a homestay at Hounds for Life, and we had a so uh, homestay with your dog. No, so the people are normally traveling at the dog stays for holidays. Oh, I see what you yeah. mean. All right, <laughs> wonderful. With a spa treatment? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> How fabulous. Yeah, so we oh. had, um, who was there? We had Jasper, all the old, old, old boys. And we they get Jasper. to meet each other. Yeah, they meet each other. Oh, right. And play together. And So yeah. Harry and uh, Jasper were there at the same time and they really got uh, um, grow together as friends. They were really, oh. really lovely together. Um, and then we had BJ staying. He's a freak. So it's like holiday camp for the It's a hands. holiday camp for <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. But they don't have to do their own washing up. No, I think not. Oh, they <laughs> no, they're lucky. Great. They have the volunteers to look after them. Oh, oh my gosh, I want to be a greyhound. Yeah, How your, wonderful that would In be. your next life, eh? yes, okay. you want to be your own dog. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always say. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Oh Wonderful. yeah. All right. So you um, you can enjoy the show. So just stay tuned, and we see you in the first segment. Wonderful. See you later. Bye. Little darling, it's been a long, long racing season. Little darling, it's time to rest and find a home. Here comes the hounds, didn't you know? Here comes the hounds, and I say it's for life. Hounds for life. Hounds for life. And now for our interview with Sandy and Ghost. Yeah, Sandy is a local. She uh, has lots of animals. You would see that on the footage. And um, she uh, started her houndy journey with um, Italian greyhounds. And then she adopted her first ex-racing greyhound was Ghost. Mm -hmm. And you see Ghost, he is quite, quite an aged boy. And he was already um, on his way out when we interviewed them. And he has passed mm -hmm. away now peacefully meanwhile. Um, so it's a lovely mm. little memory. memory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the good news is that she had also fostered one of our greyhounds, Perry, and now is adopting oh. him or has oh, adopted. Oh, lovely. That is lovely. Yeah. My name's Sandy, and I live in Picton. I've been in this house for about ten years, and I've always had dogs all my life. Um, well, once I grew up, I did. Um, the main thing is that I've got Ghosty. I've got a whippet called Lee and a little mini pincher which I've only had for probably about a year so um, when I first got Ghost I got him because I'd just lost my last Italian Greyhound and they are just little wee tiny things and I thought well I love the shape of them I love the form of them but I got a bit of a surprise I, I asked for a dog that was you know, quite laid back. Um, I did know that they were fairly gentle, gentle giants if you like. So I got Ghost and I brought him home and he'd only been, he'd only been a couple of weeks off the racetrack and it was not a very good idea. He should have had a little more adjustment to life in, in, inside. And I remember bringing him home, and um, he, he was totally stressed. He was really upset. He was panting. He was not hungry. He just didn't know what, where to put himself. So I took him into a nice, quiet spare room, and he didn't know how to get on the bed, so I helped him up. And eight hours later, he's still there, and I'm thinking, oh. Anyway, he didn't know how to get off the bed. <laughs> he was busting. <laughs> so we took him outside and he went and he went and he went. And it took probably, I don't know, quite a few weeks before he, he settled down enough to, he just wasn't happy inside. So I had a great big kennel outside on the deck. And when he got really stressed, that's where he'd go. That was his retreat. And I kept that there for about a year. It was necessary. Because if we had a party or loud music or something, he's straight outside. He didn't like, he just didn't like all the noise and the, the hype that was going on. But it wasn't just that. 
he, he'd been called Ghosty, I think, for a while, but he didn't know his name. And he still, if he doesn't want to come and you call him, he will not come. And that's all there is to it. <laughs> and I had to have a lot of training with the Whippet for the same reason. He, he was a year old when I got him. But Ghosty simply doesn't respond unless he wants to. He will do his own thing. And that's okay because he's, he's not, you know, he, he never gets himself into trouble or anything. But when I started taking him for walks, I don't like putting dogs on leads. I prefer not to. And they say you shouldn't do that with a greyhound. Well, I took him up Essence Valley, which is a big, long, skinny track that goes up to a dam. And it was in the summer when I got him. And I remember taking him up there and he thought that... Um, he thought that the dam was solid. He walked straight onto it and started swimming, not realizing it was, he got such a fright. <laughs> of course he doesn't, they don't like water much, but he's actually, he's, he's, it looks like he's answering me. But yeah, he, he got to like water about that time and he, he would go for swims when I took him up there. But I found, I had to let him run free on the way up there, but when, it started to come back, I would have to put him on a lead because he'd just keep running and he'd run and he'd run straight out the gate and off. And yeah, I, I never thought that I would be able to catch him once he got on the road. So that's how we managed that for probably over a year. Um, now if I was to take him up there, he'd just, yeah, he'd probably come, you know, or stop so I could catch him. But it took over a year to be able to actually catch him. And that was tough going. Um, I think, yeah, I think he was just so confused. He didn't know what he was, what was expected of him. Um, when he started to relax on the couch, then I knew he was actually getting somewhere. Um, I remember taking him to an AMP show. We were promoting greyhounds as pets, and he. Yeah, he got very upset because he thought he was going to race. I'm pretty sure that was the reason why. Because every time he heard the loudspeaker, he's, oh, 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 we're going to go for a race. And by the end of the day, he was that upset, I had to take him home. He couldn't seem to cope with the fact that he wasn't racing. He wouldn't relax. He wouldn't do anything. <laughs> Poor thing. I, I took him once again, probably two years later, and he wasn't so bad. But I decided not to take him to anywhere like that again. It was just not. Not fair. Anyway, he abandoned his kennel after two years. He never went in it except to take some courier things in there and bury them in his bedding. And I didn't know where they'd gone. <laughs> I, the courier left something at the door and he took it in there and that was his little treasure. I did find it eventually, but I chopped up the kennel in the end because he didn't need it. And uh, But I would always suggest that they have a place to retreat to when you get them. Yeah, to, for, the, for a greyhound to live with other dogs is not really a problem. Well, not that I've experienced, but I've only had one proper greyhound. The others are Italian greyhounds and Whippet. But um, they seem to get along really well because the greyhound is fairly passive. Um, I mean, the, the others will push him out of his food if I don't give it to them separately. It's not, he won't fight for it. He won't defend himself basically in any way. And the little whippet likes to race, and as soon as he tries to cut him off, um, he stops. He, he just has no aggression whatsoever. He, um, the whippet and the Italian greyhounds and the greyhounds, of course, all look very similar. But, and then they do have similar traits, but the whippet is far more aggressive. When I say that, I don't mean in a nasty way. It, he just is more dominant. The Italian greyhounds, um, yeah, they're a breed in themselves. They're quite, quite different in many respects. They're almost cat-like um, in their behaviour. But there are similarities, and they all seem to box along pretty well. Um, as far as another, other breeds of dogs go, I now have a miniature pincer who is very dog-like. You know, I sort of put the greyhound type of dog in a different category to the or, to an ordinary dog. Um, 
the greyhounds are not greedy, neither is the whippet, neither is the, the Italian greyhounds are actually grazers. And they, you can't just give them a big feed because they won't eat it. You just need to leave food out and they'll pick it all day. The first ones of any hound type that I got were Italian greyhounds. And I was so surprised at their difference from normal dogs because we had pig dogs up until that, that time. Oh, I had a Great Dane too, but that's another story. Um, yeah, the, the Italians needed to graze their food for a kickoff. Um, they, they were very courageous, but they were also very vulnerable because they had very skinny legs. And the first one I got, I was living in the sounds and, and it was, I, I wanted to take it to work each day because I didn't want it left alone at home. I didn't think that was fair. It was only a young dog. And I took it to work and I used to go in a dinghy so I had to um, put it in a little box and he got to love the water he didn't mind it at all and the other thing was that they were extremely responsive they would come when you call which is unlike a greyhound most of them take a little bit more persuasion um, the whippet was the same he needed to be persuaded that it was a good thing to come to me he learned quite quickly but the Italians responded very well in that respect um, I mean, now little one would ride on a bike, he would do all sorts of things. And when I got the second one, he was more timid, he wouldn't do those things. But the first one, well, they have such tiny legs, a lot of people have problems with breaking legs and things like that. But they also taught themselves to hunt, which I found extremely strange because, you know, they, they could actually get a possum between them, which possum was probably heavier than they were because they're very tiny. Ghost's favourite treat is when he visits my friend and she's got a big box of dog biscuits and that's one thing he really loves because he doesn't get many of those here. Um, the longest walk is probably into a batch that I have at Onehow Bay. Um, the walking track takes about an hour to get there an hour each way. Um, he sleeps at the foot of the bed but not on it um, because it's just too, he's too heavy. <laughs> but if we have a lot of visitors and there's nowhere to sleep, that's where he'll sleep. And Ghost sleeps when he's happy. <laughs> Ghost doesn't sleep in any, any I, in fact I don't put any clothing on him, he, he does feel the heat too much. He doesn't like it. I think he does have a flame inside. Yeah. Ghost isn't a very cuddly dog, but more recently he has come up and just sort of stood there and looked as though that's what he wants. And I have to assume that I'm interpreting it correctly. Okay, the smartest thing Ghost ever did was to pick up the um, parcel from the courier, but he buried it in his kennel so I couldn't find it. Ghost never snores, but he breathes heavily. <laughs> Ghost doesn't have a favourite toy. He really doesn't. He loves chewing bones. I suppose I could call that his toys. I've thought about an additional greyhound, but as I have three dogs and I'm going to be 70 next year, I really don't think that it's probably a good idea. I'll think about that one. Wonderful. Thank you so much to be on the show. Um... Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. Upcoming is a, a, a wonderful footage we see Carol, uh, how she's live drawing a greyhound, Bella, uh, from a photo. And uh, she uses, uh, I think, quite simple, basic mm. yeah, tools with it. I decided I would only give myself half an hour to do it. Yep. So it's a quick sketch. And we obviously speeded it up for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Even quicker. <laughs> Even quicker. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, okay. So you enjoy, and if you draw your greyhound, please post it and yes. comment it and send us a picture on Facebook or on email or that would be lovely. Wherever we love to see yeah. your artwork too. Yeah. Great. We can start a gallery. That would be awesome. Yay! Yay! And after this drawing, you will, uh, you come with us on a tour through Carl's Atelier here in Picton, and uh, enjoy this as well. Seeing how an art, a real artist in real life really works. <laughs> <laughs>
So we've got a range of soft and hard pencils and some wonderful watercolour graphite that we're going to use in this portrait of Bella. Starting off with a sepia pencil, this gives a nice soft structure that won't dominate what I choose to do next. So just starting with the centre of the skull, always a good place to start. And sketching in, trying to get a balance. Here we go with the eye sockets. That's probably the most important part of any kind of portrait is to get the eye sockets in the right place so that they're balanced. And technically the centre of the eye, the pupil, will be in a straight horizontal line between the two. Um, if that goes wrong, then you end up with a very confused looking greyhound. And we know that greyhounds are not confused at all. So the greyhound ears are small in comparison to their head and they're made up of multiples of folds. Um, not important to be anatomically correct at this stage with the folds of the ears, but just to sketch out the proportion of the ears to the top of the head. Now I'm just going to work a little bit the eye pupil is, of course, um, the eyeball is a perfect circle, but we don't see the whole of the pupil because of the eyelid. And the cheekbones, those beautiful cheekbones of the greyhound, the elongated nose, which flattens out from underneath the eyes to the top of the nose. Now I see some beautiful shapes coming in that I draw as a series of sort of triangles, really and the folds of the skin. Pressing a little bit harder on the pencil now just to firm up some of the uh, drawing that I will lock into place for later on. Okay, round the nose, following the line of the skull through the jaw. It's a bit like mapping out a journey when you're going from A to B. And you can keep checking with your pencil in your eye and, and going vertically and horizontally up and down. Are they level? Is you know We're not going to concentrate too much on measuring. This is a real test of drawing from life. Right, so now I'm going to pick up my, dipping my paintbrush into the big jar of water and using this wonderful soluble graphite palette. So it, I'm starting to sculpt and build on tone to give the drawing some three-dimensional um, qualities. Popping in some obvious dark blacks, again, to anchor the drawing pretty precisely and using the natural um, water held in the in the brush bristles to get some beautiful watercolour effects. So the, the paper I'm using is not watercolour paper, I hasten to add, it's a cartridge um, sketch pad. I'm not going to overdo it with the water, otherwise the paper will start to um, deteriorate. So I've got to work quite quickly here. Um, I can pick up a little bit of that black with water if I want to. So yeah, I'm sort of correcting some of those earlier sepia lines um, as I go, blocking them out with the graphite, looking at not just the tone, but also what's going on in the greyhound's skull. There's a really strong line that goes from the cranium down between the eyes and to the nose, which you can keep referring back to if you're not sure how wide to make things or, or whether or not you've got a balance between the right and the left side of the of the greyhound's face. She's also obviously got light coming in from the right hand side on the photograph so we can start blocking in some shadows. Sort of following those sketch lines from before, they're just there to give me a marker and this beautiful black nose. So there's nothing at the moment in the drawing that is dominant. We're still basically mid greys going towards the dark, but plenty of room to add later on. Right, there's a hint of the mouth there, that lovely greyhound smile, and the schnozzle, as my dad used to call it, the muzzle of the greyhound. So we're starting to see the whole head emerging now, which is really lovely. So what I'm doing is I'm trying not to concentrate too much on one area at this stage, um, sort of whittling it away, feeling the balance between the marks I'm making. So also the greyhounds have got lovely all over short hair with lots of different directions on their head. So you can start without drawing every single um, bristle, which would be impossible, start 
suggesting the lay of that fur, which again gives the drawing some three-dimensional qualities and some texture and some expression to the greyhound as well. And those beautiful eyeliner made up eyes, which are very hypnotic. So there will be uh, more black added to that as we go on, but I don't want to overdo it at this stage because that's easy to do. I'm using this lovely soft black pencil. Um, it's almost a charcoal, but it doesn't smudge in the same way um, and sits quite happily on top of this cartridge paper. A little bit of drawing and deepening those shadows where they need to be. So I'm a great fan of keeping the nibs of my pencil sharp, but as we go along, obviously they're going to get softer and softer and there'll be a point where I decide to sharpen them. But while it's still a fairly soft and broad uh, lead, I can block in some of those shadows quite nicely and quite quickly. So the nose is now becoming more prominent than the eyes. Right. So the, the 4B pencil, I've got two pencils there. The 4B pencil is a water-soluble pencil. It's probably the lighter one of the three. And it means if I do use the watercolour graphite on top, it will blend and disappear a little bit. So it gives another um, visual quality. Those lovely whiskers, one chance only to get those right. Yeah, blocking in her hint of her smile. Lovely cheekbones again. So looking at the photograph or from life, depending on how you're going to draw, your eyes are constantly darting from your subject to your paper. So it helps not to take your pencil or your brush off the paper when that's happening because you can carry on from where you left off and you're obviously working quite fast so you don't want to lose time trying to figure out where it was that you last made your your pencil mark so yeah blocking in that ear right it looks like i'm doing my sh shading quite randomly but i'm trying to i'm conscious of making pencil marks that are in the direction of how Bella's fur lies. Um, quite often what happens when you're shading in, you just do the same old cross hatching. If you're right-handed, it's obviously horizontal left down, um, sorry, horizontal right down to left and the other way around if you're left-handed. But of course that doesn't work for both sides of the head because the fur will be lying in different directions so that's just a conscious um, effort. And obviously you can see from the photograph some of her darker skin coming through in patches under her lighter fur. So that again gives you a really good clue as to how her fur is lying on her skull. So clarifying that bump on the top of the head, quite significant, and firming up the right hand side and that right eyelid and yep the whiskers go in which are balanced by her sort of quizzical eyebrow on the left giving her even more of a wise look of course everybody's grey hand has a different personality and Bella's particular qualities are one of wisdom um, it took us quite a while to get her to pose for this shot her favorite position is lying sideways with her eyes shut on a beanbag so um, yeah, that probably took as long as it did for me to get my materials ready, just to get Bella prepared for her shot. So still using the three graphite pencils. So the colours really now, the sepia pencil has almost disappeared and we're really just working in grey tones for now. At any point, you could stop your drawing and say it's finished. That's a real personal decision. It could remain a black and white or tonal study or it could progress to something else. So the, the skills and the techniques are still the same. You're just putting more layers on and more little features. And it is very hard to know when to stop. So 
So decision, little minute decisions are being made all the time between the hand and the eye. This is obviously um, the beautiful thing about drawing from life is that you are in the moment and you are really observing and you don't really know what it really looks like until you've finished. So now I'm adding some more shadows. Now, that's partly because I want to add more interest on the right-hand side, which, as you know, from the photograph, has got more light on it. So it means I'm going to have to deepen those shadows on the left-hand side as well. So that's what's happening now. Um, watercolour brushes are designed specifically to hold a lot of water. So you use the tip and the side of the brush simultaneously, depending on whether you want to draw with your brush or do a wash. Putting the collar in is given a frame to the head, so she's just not floating in suspense. Right, now here, here we're going with some colour. So I've only chosen two colours, the sepia and the ochre, but you'll see as we build up the various tones. Um, these are plastic based crayons. I like them because they're not just a lead. As they soften down, you can use the side of them as well. Um, you could probably use a pastel, although you don't want to use an oil pastel with water-based washes and um, pencil. And at the moment, I'm sort of doing a little bit of what I was doing with the graphite pencil, which is blocking in tone with the sepia and also um, adding to the direction of her fur. So it's still the same techniques, but just using a different colour. And of course, her eyes are a beautiful shade of brown, so I wanted to bring those out. And all sorts of wonderful tones and colours happen when you layer one or two colours on top of each other. So I'm not concentrating on making her brown all over. That would completely ruin the effect. Plus, we also have natural highlights coming through now. So there's very little actual white on Bella, but you want to make sure that that little glint in the eye is there. That, what's, that is what gives life to the eye, also on the nose. And mindful that we're working with white paper, so there's going to be a lot of white showing through the pencil marks anyway. So now I can block in using the side of the sepia pencil, um, almost providing a wash of pale brown on top of some of the areas of the drawing. Could, I could have chosen to use a watercolour wash, um, but again, I'm not using watercolour paper, so I didn't want to overload the paper with too much liquid at this point. But these pencils work just fine. And the great thing is I can work on top of them, again, with the graphite pencils quite easily. Right, so solidifying that juicy nose. The most important thing is to draw what you see. If you're working from a photograph or from life, you can't really go wrong. If you're working from an academic point of view, that is measuring um, anatomically correct, then obviously it's a different technique. However, I, ha I am very aware of those uh, characteristics because I've been drawing for a long time. But again, if you draw what you see, they should come out. So this is a fun part, a bit of doodling the pattern work on the collar that Maya made last podcast. Again, it gives a nice contrast to the um, painterly tonal part of the drawing just to do some fun pattern lines in there, just using the soft pencil. If you wanted to, you could make it look more like the photograph and add blacks as well. So there's no rules at this stage. If I did that, it'd be another 10 minutes on the podcast, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, now I'm filling in that area there. Under the chin, around by the ear. So that you get more of an impression of a neck without me having to draw the whole of the body. So this is... The fun part right at the end is to use the ochre crayon to do a golden wash. Again, not all over the drawing. That would be too much like colouring in. Finding intuitively the focal points, the rich 
tones in the photograph and concentrating on those. Um, for those of you who have got eagle eyes, my crayon snapped in half about a minute ago, which was quite frustrating because it means that you hold the pencil quite differently. But I've soldered on because I want to get this drawing finished. And those lovely glowing golden tones. Again, she's um, a fawn greyhound. So if you've got a brindle greyhound or a greyhound who's got patches, you're going to be using different coloured crayons, same technique, but in a different way to, um, yeah, to render the markings of your particular greyhound. But you could see how easily that could become a brindle or a patch or tri-coloured greyhound as well. So that warm colour really accentuates the edges of the mouth, the nose, unifies the drawing so she's not got colour in uh, only one part of the drawing, that it's, it's spread throughout. Ordinary pencil crayons would also work as well as these plastic crayons. And just be aware of the pressure that you're putting on the crayon. Obviously, the harder you press, the darker the tone. So um, that's all part of it as well. Getting as many variations out of your one pencil as you can. Okay. Are we ready to stop? Almost. Now that that gra earlier graphite wash has dried a little bit, it's gone a bit paler, so I'm just putting a little bit more on. It's much, much easier to put more on than it is to take off. There are techniques where you can use erasers, um, but for fine line work, you'll end up smudging. So much easier to start subtle and build it up. And here we go. Signed, sealed and delivered. Enjoy. Have a go. Kia ora, welcome to my artist studio. This is my first interview in a studio and you probably want to know why I am on a Greyhound podcast. Hey, well, my friend Maya um, founded Hounds for Life and I uh, am a good friend of hers and I was with her when she picked up her very first Greyhound, who is Bella. So it's really appropriate that I also chose to draw Bella as well for this podcast. And um, I have drawn many, many things in my life. So I'm a professional illustrator. I also work with textiles. I also teach and facilitate workshops for all sorts of different groups in the community. For instance, today I was actually teaching pirate school in Picton. Um, but I'm going to show you a, just a range of some of the work I've done over the years. Now, if you remember from, uh, or if you hear from my podcast, I'm talking about training the eye and the hand to work together and really that is the basis of all drawing and all art. So you have your imagination but also you can draw from life. So as an illustrator, um, the aim is to tell a story using pictures. Even if you're following a, st a written story, the pictures should also tell a story on their own. So one of the first things I did when I started as an illustrator was to draw um, people in different situations and that was fashion illustration. I don't do that very often anymore but I started working for newspapers and magazines and here are some of the early work that I did. So this is a very colourful piece. It actually was used for um, a video game in the early days and it's an imaginary a scene of an island using watercolour inks and um, gouache, which is like a poster paint. And I did many, many drawings that all fitted together like a story for this one. Here, I'm quite often asked to do logos or ideas for businesses. And here's a, a pen and ink drawing that I did for Earthbound Kitchen, which funnily enough is on the same site as Hounds for Life. And we have a beautiful permaculture homestead where we grow our veggies and our food. And um, I was very happy to do that design. So I get asked to do lots of very interesting things, as you can imagine. 
This is more recent work, so the love of drawing people. Uh, this is an illustration done for a magazine where they were focusing on an article about bullying at school. So I've used a similar technique to the podcast where I've drawn first and then I've used a tone to make the form stand out, which is the grey tone here, and then I've worked over it in line. Quite often I'm asked to do pictures for children's books. Here is a New Zealand children's story, true story about a rescued Kiwi um, in the South Island. And it was a lovely story to do. I had to do quite a lot of research. I won't show you the whole book, but this is one of my favourite pages here. It's about a Kiwi egg that had been dislodged by a digger in the bush and had through a series of lots and lots of different people doing different things, been rescued and then hatched when uh, it reached the Kiwi Sanctuary and then eventually was put back into the wild. So it's a story that lots of schools really enjoy because it teaches uh, all sorts of things about how to look after wildlife, but also it's a success story and it's local. So that was a lovely uh, story to do. And then last year I was asked to do illustrate a story by the New Zealand School Journal. Again, I really enjoy doing work that I know is going to be used by many, many people and encourage them to read and to draw and to make up stories themselves. And so this story is called The Little Fisherman and um, again, based on a combination of working from photographs and from the story itself. Some of the fun things I do outside of my commission work is drawing portraits, painting portraits. So when I paint or drew Bella, uh, instead of drawing a human face, I drew a dog face and it was um, using the same principles. So um, two of my paintings that are here are of close personal friends of mine. Uh, every other year, the New Zealand Portrait Gallery runs an award and the top portrait is of my friend Sarah who is a potter so it's called the potter and um, this portrait ended up touring around New Zealand as part of the Adam Portrait Award which was wonderful. I focus a lot on hands as well as faces because I believe that the hands tell you as much about a person as the face does and also it gives you another dimension to the portrait. And then the other portrait is of my friend Peter and he has, uh, he comes from the top of the South Island and he has led um, a very interesting life and that shows in his portrait. Okay, and then the, another portrait, I've just started working, painting uh, acrylics onto the back of glass, reverse painting onto glass, which is quite a challenge and I enjoy the surprise aspect of that. So I have a painting here, a, a very recent one called Sanctuary. And finally, my textile work. Um, I trained as a textile artist, I uh, did an embroidery degree way, way back. And I still like to use stitching, collage, uh, working with my own images, which I then print onto lamination and make into different panels. So these three are from a series um, of stories about uh, women in three different stages of their life. The young woman is courage, the middle-aged woman is uh, compassion, and the older woman is wisdom. So it's our journey through life. I like to use recycled materials or resource materials as well. And a few years ago, I found a whole lot of these wonderful books in the op shop, in the second hand shop in, in New Zealand. And they're the old Reader's Digest books from the 1960s and the 1970s. They have these gorgeous printed covers, which are uh, like a cloth surface. I really like them and I really wanted to do something with them that would um, save them from going into landfill. So I collected a whole pile and I went through them and took out the illustrations, which are uh, very cheaply printed, not particularly good quality, and took out some of the sentences as well, and I made, I've been making lots of collages from them, which are quite humorous and um, quite fun. I also add a little bit of paint and um, make it into a whole new piece of artwork. 
So I've always got projects on the go. I really enjoy having commissions from all sorts of different people, uh, whether it's uh, a shop that needs a logo or a local business or an um, educational book or a beauty magazine or an environmental project. Um, I really don't mind. It keeps me really interested. And um, I very much hope you enjoy looking at my website and thinking about your creative space and how you can use it because it's great fun. So thank you very much for listening. See you again. Ka kite ano. <laughs> and now for our featured foster, Foxy. Foxy is a lovely female, uh, quirky mm. dog who uh, was very joyful. Um, she was quite a while at Downs for Life Kennels um, and now she just found a home uh, with uh, BJ's dad. Oh, stay wonderful. Us. I've actually seen the photograph. Yeah, they if you look so at the happy. so happy. So, so cute. So, although Fox is not available anymore, we had the footage already <laughs> taken. <right>. So, <laughs> enjoy <laughs> that. Hi everyone, today I'm here with Foxy, who was known as Jobs Wright. She is a six-year-old female. She raced for quite a few years and was a, not a bad racer, um, but she's retired now and she's ready to go to her new home. She is pretty energetic for a six-year-old. She likes to run around. But Foxy is unable to be homed with cats but she can be rehomed with other dogs and even small dogs. Hey, good girl. She actually has like, <laughs> she actually has half an ear. It's really, really cute. She reminds me lots of my girl and she's going gray, which I also think is really, really cute. Good girl, she's pretty confident. She's good on the couch, and she is really good with other people. If you guys are interested in adopting Foxy, please get in touch with us. Hey, good girl, eh? She's really sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's too hot for walks. Yeah. Greyhounds don't want to go on, it's over 30 degrees. So and we don't want to go for walks either, no. it's over 30 degrees. So no Greyhound walks today, but we have uh, put together for you a little footage how to cool your Greyhound dog yes. down in such a hot weather and we hope to enjoy all this footage and the tips and tricks we give you yes. and we love to see you again next month and still then still till then keep cool so bye. 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 and don't forget to like and subscribe <laughs> Go The greyhound in general enjoys uh, a daily sun bath on a comfy beanbag in the privacy of their own deck. But when the temperature hitting 30 degrees are over, it's time to reconsider and find a strategy, a strategy to cool down. 
The best bet here is to seek the same comfort beanbag, but lying in the shade, which is much better. Now, the other strategy is uh, instead of uh, seeking shade to find water. Not every uh, greyhound is a uh, fancying uh, water bath, but Foxy shows us here in this episode how great it is to have an old bathtub in the backyard or a wading pool can um, be reused for the same purpose. Um, it's a little bit smaller, but the grand will step in there. Of course, the most important thing is fresh water in the bowl at all times. Um, so the greyhound can help uh, themselves to the water. Now a trick is uh, to use the rest of the water bowl to run it down the spine of your greyhound. That cools it really down and makes good use, especially when you're traveling, uh, of the rest of the water that is still in your bowl. What is not a good idea is to point the garden hose at your greyhound directly because in general they this is a means of um, uh, training the greyhound to do, not do things and they don't like that at all. So keep cool, keep your greyhound cool and stay tuned. Bye! TV, <gasps> live footage. Mm. Oh, this is a blooper as well. <laughs> We've got to have that in. <laughs> Summer is here. <sighs> okay.